Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, a live show number 366. Know your eyes do not deceive you. This is a strange man with us today. <laughs> in, in more ways than visual, I have to say. But yeah. uh, with us is Mr. Connor uh, with Top Line. And um, gosh, I'm not going to try to even begin to tell the whole scope of what you do. So I'm just going to simply ask you, Connor, what is Top Line? And then we'll go from that to the wonderful topics of the universe. Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, top line, we're um, we're a modern uh, revenue management vendor. So we do both service, we do uh, software, we do actually remote sales support, which is kind of a hotels keep dragging us into that. It's not our. <laughs> it's I not watched our that happen, thing. by the way. I have watched that happen. <laughs> you know, but yes, you you're you're witness to it. Um, but uh, we 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 recognize a lot of our our team has worked for brands, uh, and we we specialize in branded revenue management, so branded hotels, Marriott, Hilton, IHG, Wyndham Choice, etc. Um, but we also we also work in the independent space because the concepts and the principles are the same, and uh, you know we just apply them in with different systems and in different formats. So um, yeah, so basically our 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 clientele typically are uh, you know hotel owner operators or management companies that. Uh, have been burned by using revenue management services through the through the brands. Um, certainly, having worked inside the brands myself, I understand that. Uh, and they're looking for somebody who's going to be more of an advocate for their property rather than for the brand itself. And so that's where we step in. We also put a premium on personality and working with teams. Uh, that's 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 crucial. Uh, yeah. It's kind of I'm a, I'm an open bubbly person, and so I want my team to be the same way. And we have a good time on revenue calls and and in our correspondence. Uh, and then lastly, we focus on uh, using the most modern technology that's going to help push the needle uh, on behalf of our hotels. So we're going to use cutting edge uh, analytics tools, business intelligence tools, um, and uh, and really break away from the Excel dark ages that revenue management is still living in. Uh, on, there's a table's rule, man. What are you talking about? <laughs> they're just the best, aren't they? <laughs> they just, um, it's gosh, golly, swell stuff. <laughs> it really, it really depends on uh, who put together the, the call packet, right? Who put together mm -hmm. the deck and uh, how many, how many formulas they have in there, right? And, and, no, and which statistic makes them look really the best? <laughs> makes them look great, you know? Yeah, that's what it comes down to. Honestly, all that aside, uh, again, having worked in this space for a long time and worked with a many different Excel spreadsheets, everybody should be ashamed of themselves. Like, <laughs> all the management companies, which I've worked for the biggest names, all those companies should be ashamed of themselves. They're still using Excel spreadsheets. This is 2022. There's better options. Way better. And we, you know what? We should talk about some more of those options are that are available that people don't have to go crazy with. Oh, that's going to be yeah. massively expensive. But um I, the, the backlog of this ability to have you on the show is kind of twofold. One is we had Stephanie Smith, which you're familiar with and connected to and so forth and so on. And you were in the peanut gallery last week where you were throwing out some good questions for it. And of course, we've been saying you need to get on the show anyway. So that started that. The other was we have a shared love of the topic type, which I kind of threw up, which was, you know, the dynamic changes in new revenue calls. Because uh, truth be told, we have a shared client. So we have the privilege of being on calls together. Yeah. And uh, it created such a contrast for me in comparison to other clients that I have and their revenue management calls. I'm like, it literally inspired me to say, man, I want to have a show about how revenue calls should run. And AKA Connor's the example brought to the table for that one today. <laughs> and sure. also all of the, the pitfalls and traps that happen when it doesn't run the way it should and yeah. the problems that it creates and exacerbates. And uh, just in brief conversation with us, I think we share the same kind of perspective on this, but Start things, push it over to your side of the table with this. Like, so revenue calls from, and uh, actually, I have to apologize for one thing. I have always seen you in the light of revenue management because that's how we were introduced. Like, okay, this is the rev team. Okay, great. As we had got to spend more time together, I realized that you were much more multifaceted as you just presented in the, in the, the elevated conversation of what Out you of do. necessity. Out of yeah, necessity. Yeah, it is because I, to the point, I did witness where with a shared client, there was this transition of who was doing the sales efforts for them, third party, mm -hmm. to that's interesting because now that integrated into what you were able to do for them because it is that that sales, revenue management, marketing, operations uh, combination yeah. of, of dialogue yeah. that's there. And you're simply saying, look, rather than waiting for somebody to bring you the resource, I'll bring the resource for you. But yeah, no, right. Uh, yeah, to that point, just super high level, I think the marketing, revenue management and sales being in silos, I know we've always talked about how they're siloed, and that's just a it's a, it's a stupid term at this point because nobody's doing anything about it. 
But um, there are some people who are doing something about it. And they're really bringing all the parties to the table, working as a cohesive team and saying, hey, we're going to use the same systems and the same tools. And so the communication flows really well. Right. And so if we're all on the same page, looking at the same numbers at the same time and we're all pulling in the same direction because there's no look, I've, I've done a lot of things about uh, sales and revenue management and why they butt heads and why it's unnecessary. But, you know, when you're, you're doing sales commissions and they're 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 incentivized to just fill the house, regardless of what that's going to do, your transient ADR, what it's going to do, the house ADR, because you, you book this group at a super low rate. Uh, that's going to cause conflict when the revenue manager raises his hand and says, no, that's a bad, that's a bad group. That's a bad rate. Uh, we don't want it. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's ways that, you know, if you remove those, those factors, you remove the incentives to make bad decisions that are counter to the interests of the hotel. Um, you know, you can, you can, you can solve a lot of problems and you can do it better. Right. I'll probably reflect on my age when I say this, but having watched through the annuals of time and the transition from the Stone Age into the kind of we, so back in the day when e-commerce was a fractional two, 3% contribution of the world, revenue management didn't exist. They were reservations managers and salespeople were the dominant force on the, the projection of the property outside of the operations itself. They were the ones that approved ad copy, you know, inches in a newspaper kind of thing. And, things yeah. that were going on. As this e-commerce came up, nobody knew what to do with it. So they regulated it over to sales. Hmm. And it was an absolute oil and water relationship because as you pointed out just now, sales is about group booking blocking. I mean, I go back to the days when there's a huge paper book that you tuned over, turned the pages like a tomb and there was penciled in events on the room categories that you had. And there yeah. was inked in and only the director of sales could ink something in because that was a that was permanent. That was there, you know. Yeah. And then you had a lot of people penciling stuff in so they could block out rooms. So they didn't, you know. Anyways, out of that whole process, uh, sales was asked to run e-commerce, which was really at the time more transient at best influencing. So mm -hmm. they were literally feed, they were responsible for feeding the enemy against their ability to sell, free sell. Because the more they succeeded in, in controlling the e-commerce as it was growing into direct channel, the less they had as options, the more they were told like they shouldn't sell something because Transient was able to pick it up or whatever. Yeah. And to your point, uh, then as time went on and it got to its own entity and revenue managers became in and salespeople had to sometimes defer. I mean, there's a lot of times there was a transition point where the director of sales was in the conversation with an owner when they came to the property. They got walked by, their office got walked by and the owner went into revenue management's office. And that was a that was a pain. That was that was a that was a loss of, mm -hmm. you know. You know, you weren't you weren't the king's favorite anymore. Yeah. And and then all, on top of it, here you are running this transient marketing thing that actually is bleeding you as well. You're not really invested in it. You're kind of like keeping, you know, Damien's baby alive. You know, it's like, OK, that, so <laughs> then out of all of that revenue management, having control over sales, kept creating more of a resistance. And then when marketing was able to fledgling off and become something different. Yeah, right, that, that, that came to now you had two against one in the sales world. I mean, mm -hmm. mentally, uh, the other yeah. people didn't see it that way, but they certainly saw it that they were the, the evolving. And you're right. It, it got to a point where now people were about self-preservation in their discussions than they were about the betterment of the of the business itself. So, sorry, that's our today's yeah. history lesson, folks. <laughs> no, it's, awesome. it's a perspective that I honestly haven't got. I, I get it in bits and pieces from folks that had lived through that. I, mm -hmm. I didn't live through it. I came kind of late to the scene. I didn't start working in the hospitality industry till 2015. That's nowadays. That's not as late as you think it is. I mean, now you're like an old dude. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember the spreadsheets. <laughs> oh. They're still getting passed around. Yeah, but I think there's a there's a really good lesson in that, um, and it's it's just the history of how we got to where we are. And um, I it, like if I were able to remove the industry from where it's been and just put it right here, how these systems and or how these uh, departments should flow together and work together, I would put revenue management as the uh, as the 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 top of the hierarchy, mm -hmm. sales and marketing working in conjunction with them. Ultimately, like if I were to create one one department, it would be revenue management, and you have sales and sales and marketing working together with them. Mm -hmm. um, because what we come across all the time is uh, group group rates and and corporate negotiated rates. Uh, they kind of need to go through revenue management to get the final stamp anyway. Mm -hmm. um, because revenue management is looking at the transient strategy. They should all be based on the transient strategy to begin with. Um, 
but that's not how everybody sees it. I understand that. I'm also biased because I'm on the revenue management side. But no, actually, I, I was in the the war. I was in the wars uh, of when marketing and revenue management were struggling to define who should be the point of truth. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was very much at the beginning part that revenue management didn't understand the scope of what their decision process was based on and that marketing did because they had a preamble of a data that revenue management dealt with forensic data or historical data to create sure. relevancy of decisions or marketing yeah. had tangible current pace and trend data yeah. that would influence it differently. Right. Right. I was very adamant about that for a very long time until it got laid out to me kind of in nautical terms of, of you have a navigator of a ship and then you have a, a pilot of the ship. One steers it to enact what is then told where it needs to go. Revenue management is the horizon line. They're the, they're the point that looks at the purity of where do we need to be in gross top line revenue? Where do we need to go? And they disseminate that into the channels of, and I know I'm speaking to the choir when I'm talking to you, but just they're the ones that have the foresight to see where the direction and purpose of this is supposed to be in gross KPI numbers. Right. Marketing and sales are really the hunter gatherer, the facilitators. They're the ones that steer yeah. the vessel or put the coal in the engine back in the, you know, a yeah. old analogy uh, to keep the boat running. So that's kind of how I see to validate what you're saying. Revenue management is kind of the direction process of where all this goes. And then the facilitators of enacting those those directives really relies on this in the sales and, and the marketing efforts. So, you know, it's uh, kind of eye opening that your boat is a coal powered steamboat. I you know, I'm just working <laughs> on the old stuff. Boat. <laughs> all the boats. You're going to use the coal-powered steamboat. <laughs> it's better than saying I got to attack the sail, but I, then I'm going really far back or throw a boat. I have a fishing analogy. We can go that way, too. I got full nice. of it's a whole pile of them. But, yeah, nice. I, I, yeah it, it is. It, there was a long answer to a short, a short agreement. Like, yes, revenue management should tell us what the hell is going on, but it has to be in the same language, same vernacular. The KPIs have to be the same. Yes. I can't be talking ROAS as a marketer, and you're talking. Right. And, they need to, and it, the data needs to be today and plus, like forward, mm -hmm. right? Because... Mm -hmm. Uh, the thing I get most sick about is looking backwards. Honestly, Lauren, if I could eliminate star reports uh, and, and that 10 minutes of a revenue call, that's the first thing I would do. Because half the time you're looking at two weeks stale data. Yep. Uh, and, and when we're doing that, like, what am I possibly going to glean from that that I can't already decide looking forward if I have pace data, like mm -hmm. good pace data, good reservations data, and I have uh, and, and good demand registering uh, systems as well, right? Mm -hmm. Which we have, you know, brand, again, we work mostly with brands. Brands have, uh, you know, RMSs that have this, this, this demand data, whether yep. it's great or not is a different conversation, it varies. But there's, there is some data there to go off of and make future looking decisions. Mm -hmm. And so if we can stop wasting our time looking backwards and start looking forward. Tomorrow is not the same as yesterday, a year ago, right? right? It's just, it's just, it's not the same. Uh, we can pace it, make sure we're ahead, but it's not the same day. I'll have to send you because I, I, I was a advocate of this for a while. I was, uh, I think we talked earlier before the show, doing but HSMA, I've been a huge supporter of it. I was on this uh, city by city circuit presentation about convergence, the revenue management and marketing, and we had this whole concept we talk about the silos and putting out you know we, we were advocating this for years trying to get people to understand the need for what you do now um and one of the visuals i'll send to you because you probably throw it in the deck i talked about revenue management is driving a car through a regular pattern uh with just a rear view mirror you know where you're only looking at what's behind you but you're not looking at what's in front of you it's not like you're not driving down the same road and the stop sign should be in the same location and the same left turn should be made but would you really trust yourself driving only looking behind you knowing that there can be a time that, that somebody's crossing the street that didn't cross the street before that yeah. you pulled up to what you thought was the stop sign, but you're five foot short. So now when you make a left hand turn, you're running over grass because you felt not exactly where you thought you were going to be. That's how revenue management and to your point about star reports and so forth. And I do constantly fight about the fact that an over amplification of for what I call forensic data. Uh, historical what had happened. It's like going to the crime scene and, and trying to piece it back together when you just look over and see that the person that did all this stuff, grandma's house, it's right there, gingerbread house, right? That's where they ended up at, you didn't follow the footprints, they're there. Right. Um, and, and and the idea that revenue management can benefit from what you just pointed out, looking forward and saying, how does that influence the factors and star reports? Wow, way too much, inf way, way too much validate. It's like, it's like the gold standard sometimes of people's perspective. And it's like- 100%. 
Yeah, I, we fight that daily. We fight that all the time and say, well, and, you know, your RGI isn't where we expect it to be. It's not a fair share. And I'm like, I didn't choose your comp set. You chose your comp set. I don't think this person should be in your comp set. I don't think this person should be in comp set because X, Y, and Z reasons uh, that are totally reasonable. Why you chose your comp set is beyond me. And then you're expecting me to hit your metrics. Like, I understand the idea of hitting a budget. Uh, you know, we've, we've worked on a budget together. You know, we expect to, to hit these numbers as a reflection of our own performance versus our own performance. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're, when you're just comparing yourself to a comp set, it's totally arbitrary. I mean, you, it's totally arbitrary. <laughs> it really you is. Know what? You, you probably have a much more insightful look. I've, got, I've historically where, when I look at comp sets, when I forget a new client, I first look at the comp set, I can tell you why they built that comp set. Sure. You know, not just from the perspective, is this a true marketing comparison comp set or is this a you just want financials to look really spiffy when you point to them you well, know yeah i mean <laughs> banks banks look at it and so that's that's where the focus is going to be it's interesting every time we have a conversation it's okay we want to add this new competitor right but we think they do really well so what are we going to do to offset it yeah like which hotel are we going to bring in to offset it? why is that the decision like shouldn't we be looking at true competitors like all of them just true competitors yeah. No, because there's incentives and stuff aside. Anyway, yeah. it's a whole, it's a whole well, thing. One of the arguments that I get to have that maybe you don't have, but you oh, actually, because you do more than revenue management, again, I'm stereotyping what you do because of what we interact with, but I, I try to explain to a lot of people that your online competitive set has nothing to do with what you designate within your start report because the person that, across the street from you is not who you're necessarily competing with in the marketing space. Yeah. There's symbiotic markets that, um, and I always give the example that when I had hotels in Key West, I was competing with people in Vail and Aspen all the time yeah. because demographically the people were, you know, Biffies and Buffies for lack of stereotyping people uh, were deciding whether they wanted a beach vacation or a mountain vacation. And mm -hmm. so it was in that strata of competition online that you wouldn't think there was no hotel in Key West that was called the Aspen hotel. Yeah. You know, so the online market space and competition and letting them know that just being narrow casted in myopic in their look of their in market competition. Yeah. That's, that's so far down the funnel of, you need to be knowing you're competing with other markets that are similar to the demographic demand, other places that have the similarities to you. They're not, you're just competing against them because they're, they're a contrast, but you're competing with them because they're the same option, different yeah. location long before they ever get to whether you are chasing the hotel across the street. That's, that's super interesting. Uh, we're going through that a similar scenario with um, an independent property just outside of Park City, Utah. Mm -hmm. um, and we're looking at where, 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 uh, who are our real competitors here? Like where are other shoppers? looking to stay mm -hmm. if they want to visit Park City, right? Uh, Salt Lake City, which is, you know, 45, 50 minutes away. It's a big city, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Compared to Midway, Utah, right outside. Because people know, uh, if they're coming from Texas or they're coming from other places, uh, they know, hey, if I if I stay in Salt Lake, I got a ton of options. And, mm -hmm. the, and the rates are probably going to be better than if I try to go to this specific market. And I have an automobile or I'm renting one. And yep. what really spurred this conversation was, okay, why are we getting so many packages at this property that's an hour away from the airport, right? It's because people are like staying in Salt Lake City, they're, they're flying into Salt Lake, they're renting a car and they're coming out to our property. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, so that's that makes perfect sense when you look at it from the lens of the consumer, which yep. is marketing. And that's and that's not something that traditionally revenue managers are gonna get into. Nope. That salespeople, you know, maybe they get into it, but not so much, but that's, that's where the marketing piece comes in. And to your point, point, we shouldn't just be looking at hotels that are right next door. We should be looking at hotels that we actually compete against. So not to say that I do these things in a black hat way, but in an in a interesting way of gathering data, I chased down um, uh, the pump loads, um, the, the distribution of gas to gas stations as a metric of determining their volume of business. Interesting enough, because I was trying to find drive market parameters. There's there's thresholds of drive markets that we look at from the eminent, which is the two to three hour drive. Like I'm, it's kind of almost a staycation esque kind of thing. It's a short duration. You can start any time of the day, get there, and actually start the vacation when you get there. Yeah. Then you have the the next level, which is you're going to spend pretty much all of the day to get there, but you're there by the end of the evening. Yeah. And then you have the we're going to take at least a day plus a little bit to get there, and that duration, that distance, and, and so there's defined distance. The fun thing that I found out of the data polls that I was getting is, okay, so you have a gas a tank, a tank full of gas, and most cars run about 350-ish in total distance. Nobody mm -hmm. runs it to gas level. That Nobody runs it to empty, okay? Yeah, no, but yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Strangely, it, you know, we always put the parameters about 150, but it's actually 200 miles. 200 miles is a radius. 
It was spooky, the correlation. I did it from the point of origin I was first looking at, and then I inverted it and followed it around. Then I picked other markets just to see if this was a pattern. If you look at the gas, the popular gas stations into their fills of gas, hmm. it's like an, a halo of 200 miles everywhere That's you go. Yeah. So you're getting gas every 200-ish miles, which is usually about the time the kids need to stretch, the dog needs to pee, you need to eat, whatever it is. Yep. It's about a radius range. And that's the popularity of volume of, of gas refills uh, in the sense of uh, vendors filling the, the gas station's tanks uh, that runs through the whole process. You do that and then you create A to B destination or A to C destinations. Where's the B? And mm -hmm. you land that pretty much at the six hour mark. Six hour mark based on average mark miles per hour based on 200 gallons refill. And you get a nice tight radius of where people stay in yeah. the best directions to getting to you. And now all of a sudden, you target the feeder market, not at the B mark. If you're in the B mark, you target the A's and the C's. Yeah. But if you're in the C mark, you target the A mark. And yeah. totally fruitful because th then if you do, and brands don't always give you this availability, you know, geo centered, but you can, with your ad campaigns, determine the impact of offering geo targeted ads in those spaces. Say, let's just target this radiant range of these places. I've done the same for airports, which is a whole other discussion, but yeah. you do that. And now all of a sudden, and I know I'm trying to keep it to our theme, you bring it up in revenue management calls. Okay. Yeah. How many people are coming from Boise? <laughs> that's, just, that's just not a topic that is ever brought up, right? Yeah. Um, that's really fascinating, Lauren. That's that's actually, it's it's like, duh. You know, yeah. it's like, duh. Why aren't we talking about it? Because, <laughs> I, you know, as a consumer, again, looking at it through the consumer's lens, I have these conversations as I'm on these drives all the time. The way I view my vacations are, is it a day trip? Is it within two to three hours? Is that, is that a, for me, I live in Pocatello, Idaho. It's down to Salt Lake. That's a two hour drive, two and a half mm -hmm. hours. I can spend one night mm -hmm. and have a little vacation. If I'm going to where my folks live up in Northern Idaho and in, in Eastern Washington in, uh, in Spokane, um, that's an eight hour drive. OK, that takes me a whole day there, which means I need to stay at least two days to make it worth it and two days back. And so all of a sudden, as part of the revenue strategy, you're now saying, OK, if, if we're marketing to people that live in Pocatello that are going to Spokane. Right. Uh, I ought to be looking for two night length of stays. Mm -hmm. Three yeah, night length of stays is a whole consideration I didn't throw in there. But yes, it is. And, and the state matter. they're coming in. on. They might come on Thursday night so they can get a full weekend and before they got to go back. Yep, uh, which also so goes on your shoulder dates of is your gateways of like forcing the exactly extra day right. and stuff. Yep, yep, it affects all of that. Yes, and but again, if I'm if I'm targeting people in Pocatello going to Salt Lake, then I'm looking for one night stays, maybe two night stays. You know, try to push them to two nights. But days. then Park City has a whole radiant past that of people that are like, I want to go, and I'm in California. Yeah, and now you have a whole destination distance thing. I did. Um, this goes back a long ways. So I had clients in Myrtle Beach, and um, we were we had the. You know, there was a time where you could not build enough rooms because of the demand. And other times you could shoot a cannon and not hit anybody down your hallway. So golf season is a big thing in Myrtle Beach at the time. It had been at the time and that still is. But at the time, it was so there was a huge cycle to it. We were looking to try to define getting people to come down during the off shoulder season. We were able to identify. And this goes back to old analytics days where we were like, OK, school has a huge big deal. It does two things. It Cuts out the families coming because school goes back into session, but it opens up the door to all the people that didn't want to bring around the kids, a.k.a. Yeah. golfers, when they want to come down, which is why we saw the surge in golf bookings and yeah. golf packages and shit like that, stuff like that. So we then tried to figure out with the analytics on the website, the geographies. And at the time, it was pretty much down to a city-ish level. And we saw Cincinnati was a huge feeder market. People in Cincinnati, Cleveland to a certain degree, really loved coming down to Myrtle Beach because it was a drive to get there. And it was a distance drive. It wasn't one of these just get there the same day kind of thing. It was a distance drive. Mm -hmm. uh, to get there, and they would be there for three to five days, golfing, man, total hard on, come in Thursday, get off Monday, back to work, you know, Tuesday kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I did a GPS on driving. I did I did it for the summer crowd for the families, um, which was different than the golf. We wanted to push up our family push. So we di I did a GPS where I did all these interesting uh, in ball of twine kind of things. And it put on GP and we added it as a package to uh, duration of stay, three minimum stay, three weeks prior, uh, booking required, pre-arrival booking requires. We sent them, this goes how far back it was, a GPS when GPS first came out. Uh, we've got factory refurb, so it was really cheap for us, like 50 bucks to buy each one of them, built in the package price. 
that had this guide in it. So all they did was they get something in the mail. They love that fulfillment. Like, ooh, you know, it was a surprise yeah. thing. They had in the mail, opened it up. And first thing they did when they popped it on, says, hey, get ready to come to our door. And they literally clicked it. And of course, the GPS knew where it was at that point. And uh-huh. it would give the guidance right to our hotel. But the cool part was, as they came down the road, which we know they're going to because of the directions, we had these things like, hey, you're going to be within 10 miles of the biggest ball of twine. Do you want to add it to your route? Yes. And I'm the one talking and putting little pictures on it, which is it, it, the, the platform still exists it's called Geovative. Um, and we get this tour. Dude, it was crazy. We ran, we we couldn't buy enough GPSs yeah. because it solved a lot of things we didn't even That's figure cool, out kind of stuff. That's but cool. from a revenue perspective, that discussion literally came out of with the hotel, like, where are people coming from? Where can we get more July business after July 4th before August 15th? And it's amazing. It's amazing what you can what you can start thinking about and what you can find when you break away from the standard revenue call, right? When you break away from it, because uh, getting getting kind of to the theme, let's just jump into that portion. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I'm the one going on tangents here. No, you know, going on tangents, and I'm the one that's going off. Let's go to that field. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. So just just to talk about revenue calls, okay? And I'll I'll be completely honest and frank. If you haven't figured that out at this point, like this is what I'm going to do. Um, the way revenue calls have always been done, okay? There's there's certain things you need to hit on a revenue call to be considered a correct revenue call, right? If we we're to if we we're to grade it, we we're to judge it. Do I need to take notes on this? Is this yeah, thing? No, it's pretty simple. You can put it on your five <laughs> fingers. You've been enough revenue calls, you know. Uh, star report. We're going to go over star report and segmentation along with it. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure the next nine days are priced appropriately. Uh, we're going to make sure special events are taken care of because those are hot dates that we the systems generally wouldn't uh, uh, price as well as a human being, let's say. Right. Because we know things the system doesn't know. Uh, the The other things we got to do is we got to make sure that group blocks and are all uh, cut off dates and everything are appropriate, that we're not holding rooms. Uh, and then we wrap it up with a nice little summary at the end of, uh, you know, 53rd week or K date or whatever we want to call it, your rolling date. Those are really the five things for a successful revenue call. Okay. The traditional <laughs> revenue call. <Okay. laughs> but I got news. Okay. <laughs> the news I have is we have better systems and processes in place that we don't have to waste all that time because all those things I just said are going to put a GM to sleep on the revenue call we know they're sleeping we don't blame them for sleeping Mm -hmm. (laughs) because we put ourselves to sleep as we're reading all these numbers Mm -hmm. revenue managers really need to be looking at this as a from a strategic perspective not from an analyst perspective and 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 you know we focus on that over here at top line we're not perfect at it because a lot of us come from that we know how to host the revenue call the way that it's always been done but we're slowly trying to you know break break folks out of that Where we need to be focusing is on more on marketing. We need to be focusing on, okay, so our systems that we have in place, have we tuned them appropriately to match what we believe is the correct transient strategy, okay? These systems are pretty intuitive. They're pretty smart for the most Mm -hmm. part. There's a lot behind them. Again, they're not all created equal uh, and we haven't found the perfect system just yet, but they do the heavy lifting and they do it generally very well, okay? Mm -hmm. They're seeing things, they're making 5,000 pricing decisions a day a revenue manager doing that on their own, maybe we make 20. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're really paying attention to it, if it's a really hot market, you're making 20 rate changes a day. These things are making 5,000. They're looking out to that horizon a year from now. They're making those pricing decisions. We just need to make sure that they're running smoothly. They're not making weird decisions and that we calibrate and tune them appropriately. Okay. Mm-hmm. That takes like 20 of the 30 minutes of a revenue call. It just takes it out of the out of the equation. Okay. It frees up a revenue manager to focus on things like, hey, Lauren, let's talk about gas prices. Let's talk about where, where our guests are coming from and our marketing strategy around that, okay? Mm-hmm. Or room type premiums. Where should we be pricing our doubles based on the fact that we know we have all these families coming in on the weekends from Amarillo? Um, and you know, what are we gonna do with those? It frees us up to discuss all these things that should be discussed and are never discussed because we're doing so much button pushing. We're doing so mm-hmm. much tactical changes we're not focusing on strategy. And so I think that's where the that's where the future is uh, of these revenue calls. How do you, I want to ask a question. So uh, when we talk about rate variances, creating changes in rates with the, 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 the client, the property, I usually think it falls into two camps, an informed decision and a dart on a board. 
Uh, not from the perspective of the revenue manager necessarily. Well, I say that with a caveat that there are people that do that, but you in particular don't. Um, you'll get the property always seemingly willing to raise mm -hmm. the rate suggested or referred to as like, well, we can put that up to you know, $10 more, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Until it gets to the point where they, if they're first on, on hand, where they're at the front desk, know what it's like to tell somebody the rate and cringe because they know it's a high rate and they get resistance to the idea of raising the rate because they're the ones that have to smile at the people and tell them how expensive it is. And now usually that's that to me is the threshold of decision. It's not a mathematical one. It's not a strategic one. It's not. It's it's an emotion of I got to tell somebody it's that much money and I don't want yeah. to. So, no, I'm not wanting that rate. Uh, people love to sell lower rates. Um, how how do you get around selling the rate concept to someone that you're putting them into the realm of, I really feel rough about asking somebody that rate? How do you handle yeah. that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it kind of depends on the situation. But what I like to do, it starts way before that conversation is okay. I like to hire people who have on-property experience. Okay. Because now, now we're speaking the same language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We know what it's like to talk to a guest. Or we know, you know, they, they call in. Um, that changes the whole equation. The second thing is we focus really on team dynamics. Okay. So hopefully you've, you've gotten this from our team calls. we we care about each other. We talk about what are, what cars we drive. We, we mm -hmm. talk about our preferences because, because we want to know the person and we want to speak that language. There's a trusted advisorship. Now they trust that we have their best interest in mind. Okay. And so when a revenue manager looks at the numbers and we say from a 30,000 foot view, just looking at the numbers, there is room to push this rate. Even if it's uncomfortable, we know the property is not in the best shape. We understand that, but we know people are willing to pay even if they do so begrudgingly, right? Okay, so we've identified the date. We now say, hey, we probably need to be about $50 higher than where we are right now. And that puts us into a space this hotel has never been in, okay? Uh, <laughs> we first approach it, we, we make sure our ducks are in a row. We say, is that really the right decision? If we're going to be the market leader, even though we don't have a place being the market leader, um, you know, expect that there's some sales give and take that's going to happen. Okay. We approach the general manager and say, hey, listen, guys, this is what I'm seeing. This is what the numbers are saying. I recognize this is not a rate we've been to before, and it's probably uncomfortable, and you're probably going to get some negative reviews if we do this long term. But in this specific instance, I think it's still warranted. It's still appropriate. Uh, this is why. Do you think, what, what do you think about that? And then give them an open-ended question mm. to, to let them share their concerns. Inevitably, they're going to say, I don't know about that. Our, you know, our rooms are in, in, in pretty bad shape right now. We haven't renovated in eight years. Mm. Uh, and then, you, then, then it comes the empathy and the discussion from human being to human being, which is, yeah, I get that. You don't have enough housekeepers to flip the room or uh, you know, the, the, the room shape. I understand that. And so mm -hmm. then that's where the conversation happens. Like, is this still a good decision? Maybe we settle at $25 higher than where we're at. And we give it a shot for these specific dates. But for us, it's being specific, being backed up by data, and then make sure that we don't, we don't go over the human, the human portion of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a conversation. And that we as revenue managers know the general manager has the final say. Okay. If they're not comfortable with it and I see that there's opportunity to push, uh, my job is to get them to slowly dip their foot in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then when they get when I get feedback that it's really impacting our scores, maybe we let off the gas. But we have to take that non-quantitative approach uh, or perspective into consideration when we're forming strategy. That guest reviews are gonna it matters. It matters even if it didn't you know change my revenue for the night. Sure, you know it's funny because you answered it in a way that answers both sides of it because exactly the methodology that you approached about being able to propose in a substantial rate increase is exactly from what I understand exactly how you would invert it to talk somebody off the cliff of dude you can't charge that yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely <laughs> no, absolutely and, and that's and that's why again going back to it start from the right place get the right person who's had the experience when we're talking about overbooking and we want to overbook the hotel we don't want to oversell the hotel on the day of arrival we want to mm. overbook the hotel knowing that there's going to be wash leading sure. up to absolutely it. so many gms have had really terrible experiences front office managers have had terrible experiences with and they're trying to walk a guest i've had those i've been a front office it's, manager it's the hardest thing to teach and the most thing you need to know so, yeah, exactly yeah. 
And so depending on where they're coming at from a perspective, that can be a tough discussion, right? Mm -hmm. And so it really, there's a lot of handholding and saying, hey, we'll be in this together. And if if we oversell and have to walk, then I'm going to turn it off for the next month, okay? Mm -hmm. But walk with me and I'll show you that we're not going to oversell. You're not going to have to walk anybody, but you need to follow these procedures, right? You know, uh, wait until the last person of the day or, you know, whoever it is. Make yeah, sure but you- why is Ross on your team if he doesn't do this stuff? I mean, what- <laughs> <laughs> Ross joined the chat on the other side. Oh, nice. Like, yeah. 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 We're trying to figure out why Ross is here. Why is Ross even on the team? I mean, he's a cordial guy, friendly as day is long, but does he really know what he's doing? I mean, I you know what he's doing. <laughs> Ross is a really good example of uh, someone who comes from an operational background yeah. and why he's able to, I'll remember this, Lauren, uh, <laughs> why he's able to, uh, you know, correctly empathize. Uh, and he's also softy. So yeah. um, one of the other things about revenue calls is, should the revenue manager be making the decisions and convincing the property team? Or should they be asking the property's team permission, right? Mm-hmm. Every revenue manager's personality is different. A lot of them don't like confrontation. A lot of them don't have a, I'm going to tell you what it's going to be and I'm going to fight to the bitter end until I get my point across. Um, I think I think a good revenue manager is assertive and, and proactive and planning what rate changes, what discount changes, uh, you know, what strategies they want to implement. They bring it to the table because they've sharpened their axe for four hours and then they, they present it to the property team. When they get pushback, they're able to then explain why, uh, you know, yes. why why we yeah. want to do it. And if they still don't get buy-in, it's okay. I have to balance up my conversation with Ross. I've watched Ross very def- deftly go over and coordinate the conversations of, and a lot of people don't maybe realize sometimes the influences on the conversation that are behind the scenes. You have ownership that's driving revenue demand. I want more money. I mean, I, I'm not saying that everybody's evil and what have you. They're in the business to make money. That's mm-hmm. why they're investing in everything else. And their ability to say that you can offer them more money if we were to raise rates is always a constant question that is in any conversation spoken or not from their perspective. How can we make more money? That's tempered a lot of times with the realities that you just mentioned about the, the capabilities of the property, the capabilities of the team at the property, and the education and training level of the property to handle that anything from a walk to a yield strategy to anything else that requires mm-hmm. them, them to be engaged with it. I've watched Ross talk and defend a perspective of raising rates logically, where it's not just because we can make more revenue, which is the default answer of like, hey, you're in to make money. So this is making money. It's the negotiation of how this to what you just said, an echo of what you said, how we do this in such a way for this moment of or for this reason of for this yeah. duration of yes. knowing that we're pushing the boundary of something. But in a, in a great positive way, we don't know until we try how people will respond. Is your team asking the right question? I've seen Watch Ross ask the right question. Is your team capable of handling the higher demand to this from a support point of view? We don't want to create negative impacts on your reviews. I've yeah. literally heard Ross say that, you know, mm-hmm. and having that kind of discussion where you're talking through all the influencing factors, not just the, oh, the GM or the, or the, or the, whoever's repping the property at the time is against raising the rate, as I mentioned, because it's uncomfortable to be at the front desk when you say the rate versus the demands on ownership or management companies that are looking for revenue optimization, yeah. revenue. It's a nice balance. You guys are on Occam's Razor as well. I mean, you're on that, it can go either way perspective. Yeah, so. we, it's, we, we live in a world of gray when it comes to decision making. And, and most of the time we don't get validation of the decisions we made. Um, we it's just, a thankless damn you job. Don't, you don't know. I mean, we're, we're not, yeah, we're not able to compare it to we just aren't yeah. compared Ro- to what, what, Ro- what Ross, did I make it up for you? Am I back in the good side? You're not going to bash me on the next call, right? Good. Talk to me, Dave. Talk to me, Goose. <laughs> Talk to me, Goose. <laughs> um, but it, the key word that you said is, is a negotiation. It's, I mean, it's yeah. a dance. It really is. And um, and the, the better teammates you are, the better we're able to come to really good solutions. <laughs> we're, good. <laughs> we're good for now. I'm on the edge still. I'm not totally off the hot seat, but I'm okay. I'm a little better on the better side. That's so, right. Going back to just the example I gave you about the gas thing, just to, to tell you this, the depth of it, that yeah, this was one of the better revenue calls. I mean, outside of having the ones I have with you and Ross, um, yeah. we is, know we know ours are the best of the best. But and yeah, I'll, yeah, there's a benchmark. Yeah, there's another conversation. Yeah, there's conversation. Yeah, there's, yeah. So in this property that I did this research for, because I was trying to make a point, um, there's a lot of talking voices in their heads about what people's. Everybody has a freaking opinion. You know that. Oh, yes. I think we should do this. I think just turns the out. Is, is, yeah, is it is it supported with data that is usable data, not interpreted data? And I say interpreted data is like anybody can make a number look good if that's the number they want. It's is the data in all of its relevance leading towards the the affirmative or or declamation of your idea? Does it support it or does it crush it? 
So when I did this gas thing, I based it on just not the revelation of the ranges of this gas thing, but also I looked at the demographics that we were getting in. This is from the marketing perspective. Who are we getting in? What is the aggregate income? Because a lot of platforms can assume from the data that they know of people, especially Facebook, uh, what their income levels are. And then also talking to the property about who's at your front desk, who's in your lobby and in your know, families of four, what are the age of the kids, six to nine? You know, do you have this parameter of what their ages are, what their potential incomes are, what kind of cars are in the park and lot, so forth and so on. So what it found was statistically, we because there's tons of free information and other information you get, People on average in the U.S. take two vacations. One is usually centric to a holiday. One is centric to the summer, regardless of whether they have families or not. The duration and the extent of the vacation is contingent upon families. And then the other contingency is total income. Because in general, people will spend upwards of 10% of their gross income for their entire vacation choices that mm -hmm. they make. Mm -hmm. Given that there's a holiday one, which is usually a two to three duration and or, or you know can be distances of flights and so forth, there's a percentage that's variable as to where they go to. But just the second, the family vacation has the longer duration, which means there's more accommodations mm -hmm. and more entertainment expenses compared to the holiday one, which is more travel expense to get there, yeah, flights sense. and so forth. I mean, this is all data. I mean, I'm, I'm not just saying this out of an opinion. I'm saying this because there's data that says this is what yeah. usually people are spending towards. So if you look at the demographics that we're looking for this particular client, they had a, an average mean income between seventy five dollars and $99,000 on average they were coming into. Family of four, average age was seven to nine years old of children, usually two children. Their duration of stay was three nights, 3.1, you know, because you don't yeah. know how you spend 0. 0.1, but it's there. Yeah. Um, and you figured the total value of their of their conversion. That meant that you had a total amount of money they could spend for accommodations. If you looked at the radius they were coming in from, they had to pay for travel expenses. Flight versus drive, based on where they were coming from geographically, which is also from the property, we determined that most of it was drive at certain radiuses. At current gas prices, we realized from the national average that the difference between $4 and $4.10 at the time was a 14% reduction in what they spent for the rest of their vacation. Yeah. So the more they had to spend for gas, the less... Technically, they could spend for all the, the food, which was $27 per head per day mm -hmm. on average, um, the, the accommodations and, and the entertainment expenses that were usually related. So we came up with the amount of money that was spent on all the sections that are going for travel. Like you're saying, the common sense. How far do I go? How much do I spend? How long do I stay? How much, you know, how much money do I have to do all this? And we figured out that this is the end of the long story. It affected the rate we could demand mm -hmm. because as much as we could compete we're trying to stay mid-tier in the rate strategies compared to the comp sets. As much as we could compete with asking a higher rate because it was just the feast of people's demand at the point, yeah. we saw that we had a better yieldability and an improvement on our service scores if we stayed in that range that wasn't trying to just beat everybody out on rate, but we could because it fit into the budgets of the people we thought were coming well, in. And it's a, it's a concept, it's a concept that we use in revenue management a little bit differently, but it's it's not about what you show, it's what you capture, right? Mm -hmm. Investing in the, the interest of the hotel isn't necessarily a huge rack rate. In fact, often, I'd say probably a majority of the time, a big vanity rack rate is going to do way more damage to your hotel yep. than it's going to improve ADR. Yep. Right? If, you, if you put a correct rack rate and, and base your discount strategies appropriately off of that, you're going to have so much more success when it comes to ADR. Because mm -hmm. you know, capturing two rooms at $199, which is an appropriate rate in this case, uh, is, is much better than capturing one room at $300. Yeah, I mean, and and, and the expectation, as you pointed out before, the expectation yeah. levels, service levels, and everything else. The room isn't to that caliber. The service isn't to that caliber. Last mm -hmm. summer is a, probably a poster child example of hotels. Oh yeah, they, basically destroying their reputation. Yeah, in lieu of yeah. grabbing short term cash. Yeah, uh, all the housekeeping issues that we have. We're working with a couple of properties in Los Angeles. If you're familiar with the housekeeping ordinance that's going on there, mm -hmm. big deal. It's this deal that's that's. I don't know all the intricacies because it's so complex and ridiculous, but uh, Los Angeles, go look it up at some point. They're, they're oh, going through this big city ordinance around housekeepers and uh, at what point they start getting overtime. And it's it's very, very restrictive. Mm. Uh, and so we're going through real time changes with with, uh, you know, governmental changes in the in the area and the city. Is Interesting. But how that impacts revenue strategy. We're having to negotiate how many rooms we can actually sell on a night. Because of how many housekeepers and what rate of pay, because the rate of pay is just, you know, double, tripled in a lot of cases. Wow. Uh, and, and so now we're having to hire twice as many housekeepers and pay them part time instead of full time. It's, it's this whole deal.
It sounds um, kind of funny. Like, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying, but but that's that's all impacting revenue strategy. And it's going to be very specific to Los Angeles County. I, I can know? say two things. Um, I don't know. I think I've ever told you about revenue. I actually went to Hilton's Revenue School back when it used to be only in Beverly Hills, and you went through it, and it was no. you either get a 90% score every time, or you were asked to leave. And they never told you your final score, but they alluded to whether you were better than somebody else. Um, it, it was it was a brutal cutthroat because it was a matter of attrition. It, very few, only uh, something like twenty some percent actually finished the revenue school. Man, I'll allow it. I, mean, <laughs> I like I like meritocracy. I like I like merit based. Uh, it's like it, what is it uh, the the game where you get shot if you don't do what they say? Where, you know, they, they this is coming from a C student. I'm not an A. Student, <laughs> you know? I'm average as average could be, and that was a yeah. that was a goal for me. <laughs> I like hiring A students, but I <laughs> surround it with power. But, but, yeah, exactly. But the the idea of the revenue management, we, we had two influencing factors when it came to revenue strategy, which has always helped me in the conversations was, especially with branded, you have the thresholds of redemptions based on points and so forth. Mm -hmm. And there's ways to manipulate that. And there's ways to do good or bad for that. Yes. Um, right. <laughs> we talk about go to the dark the side. Revenue, but, you know, we, we do. That's that's something we're going to do for you that a brand isn't going to do. We're going to talk about how to use the brands. How own. can you get past that threshold to get full redemption back? ADR. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so there was that. And there was there, there's also the idea that yield abilities um, based on scale of what you could get for your reviews and what you were actually getting for brand contribution versus what you were able to solicit for yourself. Those discussions did it. it it's neat because I have to give you both you and Ross, Ross, Ross compliment back to you, Ross, buddy, um, is you bring them into the dialogue. And, and I told you actually that I had, that was the concept of this. And, 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 and there he is. He's smiling. Um, was uh, the contrast in revenue calls that I get to share. And again, no detriment to brand revenue management and or other revenue management companies, but there is a full spectrum. And I related to being like a husband that shops with his wife for clothes. There is the husband that just wants to pa get past it. Just tell me when we're done with this. I'll sit out here and you buy whatever you want. Then there's the partially interactive one, which is, uh, you know, like, oh, hey, that looks great. Or, you know, that looks bad or whatever. Then you have the totally engaged ones. Like, you don't have shoes that match that. I'll go find the other size for you because I think that you said that was too small. Let me find you a different one or vice versa. It, and that's the spectrum of it. You have, as you said, the GM's falling asleep because you're sharing just bulk data. A lot of the properties don't know what they're making decisions on, yeah. but they're being asked to make a decision and right. they defer. I, you know, they, they, they want to say that they made the choice, but there's, they don't want to be blamed for the choice. They yeah. call it deniable right. culpability, you know, close yeah. enough to take credit far enough away yeah. to see if the blast doesn't hurt you. Um, you guys are excellent. And in, in the spectrum of above on the, on the exceptional side of soliciting the logic for a decision to be made. Hmm. A lot of times I see a lot of revenue management calls where it's almost like they're scared, like, and you like this? We would do that? You know, there's no affirmational mm -hmm. process. Yeah. yeah. Should, should we do it? Yeah. Uh, we're not perfect in this. And I appreciate the, I appreciate the compliments. It's something that we do focus on, right? Uh, it, it, it's, we get it, get the, get the hotels buy-in, right? And the, the complicated part about it from our angle is the different personalities that we're dealing with, right? A lot of general managers or DOSs or regionals, uh, you know, they're on a call and they, a lot of them have already checked out the second you've checked in. Right? Yep. They, they just have because they've been on so many revenue calls. And they've been burned so many times. That's been so stinking boring that we really need to spend less time talking about numbers and spend more time talking about them as an individual. Talk about mm -hmm. them and their dog, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to build the relationship. relationship. The, next, yep. the next call, you're going to say, hey, how's, how's, how's Rufus doing? You know, your naked mole rat. How, how's he doing, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm a '90s kid, so Kim Possible was on when I was. Is it? Yes, it. Probably, yeah, it's. Probably, yeah, you're right. Right. So, uh, <laughs> but I never thought that was going to come up on a podcast. <laughs> and here we are. Yet here we are. <laughs> and here we are. Did, this is where you need to start the podcast, and we'll go. How did we get off to the reservation? <laughs> um, <laughs> but the point being that there's so many different personalities. There's also general managers that. Um, man, they, they, they want you, they, they want you to make all the decisions and mm -hmm. they just want to, right. Checkbox and then there's other ones that are like, no, no, no. I know it's best for my hotel and you're just the, the revenue manager of the week and we're not going to listen to the day. And yeah. so what comes down to is having personal relationships with, uh, you know, with the property teams, it really comes down to that. Um, yeah. and it's going to vary. It's, it's totally going to vary. And so 
put a premium on that. I, you know, there's there's plenty that are super hard business and say, if, you, if you're not talking about rates for the next 90 days and we're talking about our puppies, like this is a waste of a call. And we have to navigate those people too because sure. they're just all business all the time and that's all they care about. Well, you know, I, I, I go back to a couple of things that are some dynamics that we don't often keep in the dialogue of where we are right now. So just in the chronological history of, of the COVID impact and the pandemic impact on all of the variables that it's created for us from a mathematical point of view, there's also a real human point of view. There's a lot of people that were purged from our in, industry yes. for lack of business, and they either stayed true to coming back into the industry when the availability was presented, or they left the industry. Mm -hmm. Then there's a lot of people that through their durability, simply got pushed into a new role. Like, you know what? You were new, true and true to us. You hung out. You've been doing this stuff. We're going to give you this role because a lot of it's a reward and recognition uh, kind of relationship. But that doesn't mean they were trained for the role. It doesn't mean that they know how to do things like, okay, right. you want to talk to our new revenue team people. Oh, right. okay. Well, I'm the Dorio Duos, so I'll be there. And they don't know how to answer the questions. And the sad part, and I do this so many times with the presentations and training and so forth, is... Um, they don't, they're at a level now that they can't, they feel like they can't ask the dumb question, the mm -hmm. captain obvious question. Like, really? You're the DOS and you don't know that? Yeah. What's and, ADR? And, yeah. <laughs> Maybe like, not that stupid, stupid but, but yes. What's ADR thing to me? What does star <laughs> mean? You know, you're sitting there going, holy shit. <laughs> I actually applaud them for willing to step across that line that says, I don't know to make the decision you're asking me what this thing is. Yeah. And and it's like to your point, the personal relationship, personal relationships create that trust that you can say, hey, Connor, you know, you've been referring to MOP forever or whatever, you know, and 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 you know, I kind of think I know what it is, but can you really just clear it for me? Yeah, I love Doing that. that. You know, oh, and you do you guys do that. Ross does a great job of it, by the way. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Ross does a great job of asking the questions, and that's what we that's what we like. So when we start working with a new client, we start working with a new hotel, man, the first the first month, you had Revenue manager better just be asking questions yeah. at this point. Uh, if you jump in and think that you know this hotel already, uh, you're going to get your head bit off. First oh, yeah. off, you, you've already screwed the relationship with the property team. So anything from here on out, you're going to have to win back, buddy. Uh, don't come in and start stepping on people's toes and telling them what they did wrong. That is it. How, and how much you know. You know, I know and this. How much, how I've been doing revenue management. Blah, blah, blah. I worked with I worked with full service properties in Los Angeles Airport. You know, it's like. Okay, yeah. awesome, buddy. But I have a tertiary market, which, yeah. which I'm a Hampton Inn, in, or I'm a, a Fairfield, or I'm a, a Holiday Express. I'm a roadside and, you know, hotel in Amarillo. Like you know, people stay here because they're on their way to Dallas or New Mexico. You know, and yeah, it's it's funny you say that because you know uh, it's so easy to get tainted with the uh, statement of a, a vanilla property, vanilla location. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it is a box on a road that does a thing, yeah. and. You have that mindset that some people think that, and it's terrible because the person that's in that box on the side of the road does not think yeah. that. No. Um, and nope. then the, the reverse of it is sometimes they get discouraged because they've been treated like that for so long. They've been beaten down so long that the only way they can safely negotiate those conversations is just to accept that people think of them as just nothing more than another version of another version. Yeah. Right. And then you turn into pretty much the person that probably was like, no, buddy, you're, you, you you're do. So and yeah. And, and <laughs> you're special, <laughs> <laughs> but no, <laughs> the idea, that's when you start talking marketing talk is when I yeah, think, because I agree. then you're talking about like, well, who's walking in your door? Well, we're in the middle of nowhere. We were built here because this yeah. big company was here. They needed a place to stay when they came in for training and yeah. their business went down and they're not sending people. What am I here for? It's like, who's coming to your door right now? Well, we get a lot of people from such and such. Why are they yeah. coming? Well, we're well, about miles away. As much as we're joking about it, like each hotel is so unique. It really, yeah. really is. And so we shouldn't just be you know, treating it like a carbon copy. We should be asking these questions and getting to know the mix of sales and getting to know who their clientele is. Um, you know, I we use the Amarillo example a lot. That that hotel is very, it's a crossroads. It's a crossroads to a lot of places. Oklahoma, yeah. Dallas, New Mexico, up to up to Denver. Like it's a crossroads. And so with that, in that market, uh, it's so much different. You can have a Hampton Inn, just boom, smack dab in the middle of it. It's going to be so much different than a beachfront property. Exactly. Even if it's the same brand. And 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 it, revenue managers who are around long enough realize that. And so it's not that difficult to focus on and ask questions about their clientele. It's really not. If you dig in just a little bit in their segmentation, say, okay, what is this Boeing stuff? Like, you get yeah. a lot of Boeing? Why do you get a lot of Boeing? Yeah, what is Boeing? <laughs> Asking the dumb questions, right? 
uh, like, is there a facility next to you? Like, how? Why do we have so many wedding blocks? Oh, because you got three wedding venues right around you that are really nice, world class. Yeah. People are coming up from New York City up to Kingston, and they're staying in because they're coming out for these weddings. But the dynamics are so different from hotel to hotel. And what it comes down to is understanding your specific hotel's place in the market, whether that is bell of the ball, whether that is roadside, whether that's truckers, you know, whatever it is, and then playing to your strengths. Okay. Mm -hmm. So hotels that have this idea that there's something they're not, maybe one of the more difficult times a revenue manager can have, at least from my perspective, if a hotel doesn't truly understand where their place in the market, that is such a hard thing to overcome because all my recommendations are going to be based on how can we uh, maximize the pockets you're in, the niche mm -hmm. that you're in, right? If we're doing really good with government business, like let's tailor our strategy to take specific amount of this business because we have enough to fill the hotel with leisure transient yeah. or whatever that may be. But it starts with understanding where you really are, the self-awareness for the property. Uh, and if you get that down, man, you can see a ton of success. And it doesn't matter if you're bell of the ball or if you're at the bottom of the heap, the last choice. doesn't matter mm -mm. as long as you understand. So quick Amarillo story. Fascinated because being from Florida, humidity is a thing. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was in Amarillo. I've lived in Texas for a few years on it between Houston and Dallas. Is over. We took a road trip through Amarillo during the height of the summer. You know, why pick, why pick any other time? And I was like a 12-year-old, which is probably my maturity level and all the time anyway. You're so I'm at a gas station and I'm, I'm squeegeeing the windshield fascinated for the fact that as I put the wet squeegee on, it's drying right behind it, which <laughs> for me is like, this is crazy. You know, I'm tapping on the window for my wife. I'm like, Look at this. <laughs> you know, <the> because <laughs> it's like, you know, and then there's the Cadillac thing with the Cadillacs. In the but to, to a story to what you're referring to. Um, there's two stories. But one was I had, a, I was doing a presentation in Vancouver and um, for a, a company and the guy that had the hotel up in Yellowknife comes to me big burly dude typically what you would think would be somebody that lived in Yellowknife Canada and he says Lauren great discussion about e-commerce blah 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 so forth and so on but it doesn't have anything to do with me I'm like what are you talking about he says six months out of the year I have the oilers up I can't I could put I have put tents behind the house just because or behind the hotel just because that's how much I, they'll stay in a tent that's yeah. how much the people are looking for other yeah. six months he says nobody not a thing and especially when the ice breaks and people can't get to us and blah, 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 so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. He says, so all this talk about marketing, this great stuff, I think it's going to help a lot of people, but it has nothing to do with me. And I'm like, fair, you know your business, you know your marketing, you know the thing. That's what the hotel is built for. Great. Congratulations. He says, hey, if you ever want to make it up and uh, shoot a 16-point buck or pick up a 20-pound bass, let me know. And I'm like, hold on just a second. Can I do either of those things during the six months you don't have anybody? He's like, oh, yeah, we got about three months before it freezes, uh, to freeze up. I'm like, huh. Turns out Japanese men from the Kyoto area truly like getting off the grid. <laughs> and if you sold, <laughs> you could target them to, and this was no easy trip to get there. Dude, it was like a flight, a ride, a bus, a hopper, a flight. It was crazy to get to this place during this time of the year. Mm -hmm. Totally sold them out. So now he only has three months where he doesn't have anybody. But nice. the idea to what you just said, there's always something about why that place is there that you don't always consider because sometimes the people at the property are so close to the product. Yeah, they don't see for what it is. You know, the Amarillo thing. People dorky like me coming out of Florida that are fascinated with the fact there's no humidity in the air. It's yeah. like, oh yeah, let's go to the Cadillac thing, and I'm going from somewhere to somewhere. Pick them up. Great paint the Cadillacs. Them. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it 100. I, I back you on that. That's really fascinating. It, it, uh, it's it's like um, I don't know. Getting getting to like some practical steps, right? Like, what can revenue managers do? Um, I I think the first part is revenue managers can ask a lot of questions. Get away from the get away from the mold, get away from the spreadsheets, right? Mm -hmm. uh, focus on that team cohesion. Another thing they can do is go visit your properties. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes the brands they'll allow your revenue manager to come out if you pay for it, mm -hmm. right? Which, from a hotel's perspective, it, it's not that big of a cost if if you can trust that your revenue manager is going to be there in a while, right? You're not going to get a new one in three months. Right. Uh, but using a third party vendor like ours, we we go visit the properties because we know that we need to understand the flow of traffic. We need to understand exactly where we're at in our market and what the hotel condition is like. Um, and, and those are just two simple things. And if you can't do either one of those, you could spend a whole revenue call on Google Maps, Google Earth, excuse oh, me. Oh, yeah. 
And, uh, and I mean, just get down to the angle. See right above the treetops is the Presbyterian Church across the street. Like, do they bring in business? Is it a big, you know, what's going on? Do they have annual events? Hey, total geeky thing. You should buy it for Ross because Ross will probably use it. Get a VR headset. There is an app in the VR world um, called Wanderer. And you can go anywhere Google Maps is and stand there in VR and look around. Yeah, that's it. That's that's a cool Ross, Ross business expense, man. Send He's it in. Gonna, I'll write it off. Uh, <laughs> Ross, but you're going to have to post a video or a picture of you wearing that thing because they are so goofy looking. They are so goofy. But you know what? And Ross, I'll hook you up with some games. Um, we'll play some shoot 'em up games. You're going to love it. And it'll be all business. Don't worry. It'll be something I, we'll figure out on business. I model. did a VR headset one time in a, in a mall. It was it was a blast, man. I was like shooting robots. <laughs> <laughs> Just guns blazing and they're coming from behind you. It's, it's Dude, a fun I, time. I could geek you out. My all wife is sitting there. You just look like such a goob the whole time. Like, my wife has video of me playing. She says, "If I ever piss her off, it's going on social." I'm like, "I'm not gonna piss you off." But yeah, <laughs> I, I, I actually developed in VR the spatial stuff. There's some pretty cool stuff because anyway, that's a whole other angle. But yeah, we are at at that point, yeah. dude. First, first, this is the first of many conversations. I hope I, I will keep dragging you into these things as we can go forward on stuff. Always know that I, you're well more than welcome to join in, participate, not just be in the peanut gallery like Ross, who didn't want to pop up. Which I didn't even offer Ross. We didn't even say Ross, come join us. Yeah, Ross, hey, next time. You know, I heard that you're a very handsome, dashing man, uh, totally fit for camera work, and uh, you love being in front of. Matter of fact, you wanted to be movies. I think yeah. didn't you say he wanted to be yeah, in movies? Yeah, right? he was in the movies. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, works out perfect for us to get you on because that that eye candy thing for us makes me look great. Eye so. candy's good, Ross. We need you. Yeah, we need smile candy, Ross. Come on, next time. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I don't want to be remiss of the fact that people should know where to find you and reach out to you and bug you and ask you meaningful questions of the meaning of life and stuff like this. Where can they find you? Info at toplinerm.com. That's a good place to email us. You can go visit our website, toplinerm.com. Um, yeah, I mean, those are probably the best two places. LinkedIn, I'd also say we've got a pretty good set of followers that uh, like to follow our uh, our content and stuff. And we're always trying to post relevant stuff and give shout outs to our clients and stuff like that. So um, yeah, just on LinkedIn, top line expert revenue management. You'll be able to find us with a big, uh, the blue T uh, it's blue and blue and dark gray, actually pretty sharp. It's it looks, like, it looks a little bit like that right there. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm going to keep bugging you to come into the show. So, you know, that's going to be a perpetual thing. Uh, thoroughly, okay. thoroughly enjoyed you being able to be on the show. Thank you. First off for being in the peanut gallery last week with, when we're, you know, chasing Stephanie around with questions of the meaning of the universe. Now we got to bug you this week. So anytime I get to listen to you and, and Stephanie go out, it's just a, just a big point. So. <laughs> oh, you see what put alcohol in that conversation. It totally changes the tone. It did, then it's like, know. I'm absolutely right. <laughs> I don't know if I'm brave enough for that. <laughs> oh, you'd be right there with us. You'd be toe to toe on the conversation. I am absolutely no doubt about that. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you all. Thank you everyone that watched us. Uh, on, I didn't I ignored any question that came through, and I apologize. Uh, I will make sure that any questions that the director to work on, I'll get them over to him so he can reply back to you if, they, if I missed any of them. Uh, Connor, thank you very much for the time. Sincerely appreciate the dialogue about it. Uh, I know it's a super sexy talk for, for people like, ooh, mm -hmm. revenue management calls. Revenue management, yeah. <laughs> yeah, can't give me enough of that. Um, oh. But in, in all honesty, if they don't work, they they. they really does make a big difference on whether the hotel is uh, or property of in, in general is, is successful in what they're doing. If it isn't a good call. So yeah. thank you for clarifying some of the ways of doing it right. So, well, thanks for having me today, Lauren. Uh, real pleasure as always. Thank you. And everyone else. Thank you for your time today. This we repeated of course, uh, 1130 AM Wednesday morning, Sydney, Australian time, 1130 AM uh, London time. So people that may have missed this want to play it back and listen to the wisdom and insights of Mr. Connor. And then you can, so good stuff. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks, Connor. <laughs>